Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. The influence of the work of Francois Laruel is still emergent in the Anglophone world, for many reasons perhaps, but also largely because some of his important writing has either remained untranslated or is now in the process of being translated by scholars, such as our two guests in the room with us here today, Jeremy R. Smith, who has appeared on the show in the past, and Jacob Van Geest, who is joining us for the first time, are both helping to bridge the gap that is bringing the work of Laruel well to Anglophone readers. In focus today is the mostly untranslated text, Nietzsche contra Heidegger, in which Laruel elucidates the philosophical and historical influence of Nietzsche on French communism in the Stalinist era and beyond, while building many of his own concepts to do so. In a moment, we will look at Laruel's idea of political materialism and his repurposing of some familiar ideas. But first, let me introduce our guests, Jeremy and Jacob. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here again, Craig. Good to see you folks again. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. We'll start with Jeremy. Jeremy, can you just give a little bit of your background and how you came to the research of uh, studying La Ruelle? Oh, okay. So uh, I would say that I got interested in La Ruelle's work uh, well over a decade ago, uh, based off of translations done by various scholars, such as uh, Taylor Adkins, Anthony Paul Smith, Rocco Gangle. Um, and, uh, for the past five years, now that I'm considered a, uh, doctor of philosophy now, um, thank you. Um, now that I, I, thank you. Thank you. Um, I finished my dissertation on the work of Laura Well, um, particularly its development, um, from the early 1970s to contemporary work, uh, situating his uh, non-philosophy alongside different kinds of contemporary scholarship, um, and to also probably think about my own kind of like um, implementation of non-philosophy towards what I call non-politics, not just adding a non to the thing or anything like that, but trying to uh, integrate what Laurel is most concerned with uh, in connection to democracy. Um, and I want to say that um, early Laura Well is mostly uh, of interest to me now um, with the recent publication of uh, Phenomenon and Difference. Uh, I just have it on my bookshelf right handy. It is a big tome. Um, it is a book from 1971 translated by uh, Lindsay Lerman and published by Triple Ampersand. And it's the first of probably uh, many translations of the early Laura Well that needs to be done. Um, Nietzsche contra Heidegger is a part of that period. And and I think that like uh, some of uh, that interest is kind of found in my relationship with Jacob. Uh, Jacob and I went to, I mean, Jacob still is a doctoral candidate at uh, Western in the theory and criticism department where I got my PhD. Um, and we both have our supervisor who kind of has already done research in this area, um, Nandita Biswas Malamfi, and it would be remiss if I didn't mention her work uh, and her scholarship in this area, um, because she's been very much fundamental for uh, setting up our relationship, but also fostering that developed scholarship uh, throughout the years. So um, definitely want to give a shout out uh, to Nandita here. Um, so I think uh, we're in for an interesting discussion because uh, Jacob um, did his uh, MA thesis on Nietzsche contra Heidegger. So uh, this might be a rich opportunity to kind of uh, get this work out there and popularized. Great, thanks. Yeah, and it's great to see you again, Jeremy. Uh, Jacob, welcome. What is it that you do? What is your areas of focus? Yeah, uh, hi. Thanks for having me again. Um, so my my research doesn't really work with Larawell right now. Um, I'm currently writing a dissertation on critical posthumanism, um, drawing upon uh, Nietzsche and and Simon Don and some other thinkers to sort of problematize what I see as sort of a Heideggerian or not a Heideggerian a Hegelian undertones that I, I see in a lot of work in critical posthumanism. Um, and, uh, but 
a lot of that's not really <laughs> relevant to today's conversation. Um, what is relevant to today's conversation is is my master's thesis. So uh, I originally came across the work of Francois Laruel um, by taking a course with Katerina Kolozova um, at the new Center for Research and Practice. Um, but I, I didn't really like it at the time. Um, but I came back to Laruel uh, when writing my master's thesis because of certain problems that I saw in the work of Deleuze and Guattari and, and their work on politics um, and what I saw as sort of like an impasse that you get to in parts of A Thousand Plateaus where they're talking about deterritorialization, um, thinking about different forms of deterritorialization that they're trying to get across in that text um, towards sort of what they talk about as a, a positive form of absolute deterritorialization, which I sort of see as an impossibility. Um, and in order to get around these issues in Deleuze and Guattari, I turn to this book from Laura Well, um, Nietzsche Contra Heidegger, because I think it, it, it puts forward a really interesting way of thinking revolution um, in sort of a Deleuze Guattarian guise, but one that allows for this sort of paradoxical negativity. Um, at the heart of it that could maybe get around sort of some of the issues with affirmation that I see in the Liz and Guattari. Great. It's great to have you, Jacob. Great to have you both. Um, when reading Laruel, I immediately become a philosophical baby all over again, <laughs> not only because it's Laruel and his original concepts, but because he brings into the fray so many thinkers that we've already dealt with. Uh, most of us who do do work in this area have, you know, are already dealing with on some level. And there, there's a way in which Laruel's work is almost like a cut and paste collage of the 20th century and continental philosophy. He's just bringing in like all of the strong concepts and using that to build his own system. And so, uh, you know, clearly he's indebted to not only the work of Nietzsche, but we see inflections of Heidegger, Althusser, Deleuze, Deleuze and Gattari, Foucault is even in there. And um, all of this seems to be up against a an understanding of historical materialism or even dialectical materialism, putting at odds, you know, the figure of, of Nietzsche and Marx, which is not unfamiliar to us if we've worked with anti-Oedipus, for example. But I, I think it's just important to put a pin in that right at the top, because as we go through, there's concepts that Laruel appropriates from these thinkers, and then he puts his own spin on them. So we may actually just have to like stop, say who the thinker is, define the concept, and then you know figure out what it is that Laruel is actually doing with it. Uh, so just just to get us going from the start, Laruel identifies what he believes Nietzsche has given to the tradition of Western philosophy, which is the basis of a political ontology he calls political materialism. Political materialism stands up as a rival to other forms of historical materialism or dialectical materialism. Uh, for us and many of our listeners on its face, this is nothing new under the sun, but with so many philosophical mediators beyond Deleuze and Gattari uh, who strive towards similar uses of Nietzsche, the first question I have to ask is, what does Laruel actually bring to the table that the others before him or that the others that he's accessing do not? And maybe maybe I'll start with Jacob for that, and then Jeremy, you can follow behind. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think it's a really complicated question. Um, so, so I think to understand what Laruel is doing in Nietzsche contra Heidegger, you have to understand Laruel in terms of both a broad history of Nietzsche scholarship and a very narrow history of of Nietzsche scholarship. So. We have a, a sort of broad history um, in which we could take all Nietzsche scholarship ever published, anything published on Nietzsche. Um, and I think what Lara Well kind of discusses, he doesn't show this, and, and this is a, a, an issue I have with a lot of Lara Well, is he doesn't show you anything. He, he'll just drop concepts in and assume that you, you understand who the concept is from, understand how that concept works in their system and he'll just throw it in and you'll be like, I don't, if you, if you don't, haven't read like all to say, for instance, and he throws in a concept like the, the continent of politics, it's, it's really difficult to understand what he's doing. But 
Um, so, so what I think, how I understand what he's doing in terms of this broader history of Nietzsche scholarship is you'll have various interpretations of Nietzsche that go in drastically different directions. So for instance, if we take a question like, uh, is Nietzsche a rationalist, um, for instance, we'll get broadly different answers across the board. We'll get people like Deleuze and Guattari who are saying that Nietzsche is uh, a rationalist, that he's completely against rationalism, that he is setting forward a, a, a philosophical vision that's antithetical to truth. On the other hand, you'll get people like Brian Leder or Maud Marie Clark who argue that Nietzsche is almost more Kantian than Kant, right? That that he is pushing this understanding of truth that's a greater form of truth than is what available in Kant or previous hitherto philosophy. So you'll get these like vastly different interpretations of Nietzsche. And and you'll get the same thing in the political field, right? First, you have the question, is Nietzsche a political thinker? Well, here you'll have people like uh, Coley and, and Montaneri who are, who are going to be like, no, of course not. Nietzsche isn't a political thinker. And this is sort of the dominant position in Anglo-American scholarship as well, that Nietzsche is not a political thinker at all. Whereas you'll get more recent works um, in sort of uh, theory. There's, there's a book by Keith Antel Pearson. Uh, for instance, that argues that Nietzsche is a political thinker, but also you'll get sort of the French tradition, which is very much arguing that Nietzsche is a political thinker, or you'll get people like the Frankfurt School who are influenced by Nietzsche, who are who are more, maybe more implicitly than explicitly arguing that Nietzsche is a political thinker. But you'll get these like vastly different interpretations. And even within that question, you'll get people like Domenico Lacerdo, who's arguing that Nietzsche is fundamentally reactionary. You'll get other people who are arguing that Nietzsche is fundamentally revolutionary, right? You'll get all these different interpretations. And more so than other thinkers, it's difficult to sort of say, well, this interpretation is right and this interpretation is wrong. And part of that's due to the nature of Nietzsche's scholarship as an aphoristic thinker. You can pretty much find an aphorism that'll justify no matter what you want to say. And this gets even worse if you go into like the Heideggerian tradition, which Laruel is following, um, which is basically saying, well, let's also go into the Nachlass and think through these concepts that Nietzsche never published um, that are as vast, if not more vast than what is present in his published scholarship. So you'll get, you, you get all these different interpretations because of the nature of the aphoristic style. Um, and there's a tendency then to, to say, well, this interpretation is true, or this interpretation is true, or this interpretation is true. So we might say, well, Deleuze's interpretation is wrong because of um, the fact that he goes into the Nachlass and uh, find something in a letter to Nietzsche and has the basis of the will to power in that letter, right? I, I think it's a letter from Carl Jaspers or something that that Deleuze finds and bases his concept of the eternal return on. Um, it's not even something Nietzsche says. And so we can say like Deleuze is wrong and I don't know, uh, Brian Leader is right. Um, that's, 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 that's one way you can do Nietzsche scholarship. But um, Laura Well doesn't want to do that. Laura Well wants to say, well, what if we take instead as a principle that we have these different ter interpretations of Nietzsche, and rather than think that one is historically accurate to Nietzsche as a figure, we say, okay, why is it, or what is it about Nietzsche that makes it possible that there are these different interpretations? And so vast, uh, so vast a, a number of different interpretations. Um, what is it about this scholarship that enables it? What is it that enables a uh, Nazi reading to go alongside like a revolutionary reading? Like how can how can Heidegger read this and see something, and then Marcuse read this or some and see something, or Deleuze and Guattari read this and something? Um, so so it's this this vast plane that we have in this broad understanding, uh, in this broad history. And then we have a much more narrow history, which is the history of where Laruel is situated in French readings of Nietzsche in post-war France.
France. Um, so here we have an influence of people like Bataille, people like Deleuze Guattari, people like uh, Jacques Derrida, and also Foucault, um, who are large, and those latter, those latter three categories or three groups of thinkers are largely coming out of a Heideggerian tradition, which is much less interested maybe in a historical reading of Nietzsche and much more interested in sort of thinking through um, Nietzsche as sort of phusis or physis. Um, this is something that comes out in Heidegger. It's something that comes out in Derrida, uh, perhaps less explicitly in Deleuze and Guattari, but it's definitely there. Um, thinking, thinking about this physis or phusis um, and bringing out this sort of libidinal aspect of Nietzsche, less as Nietzsche as a thinker of a libidinal drive and more as Nietzsche's scholarship as having these sort of libidinal properties. Um, and within that history, we really see, uh, we really see Laruel emerge trying to bring together different aspects of these thinkers, most notably Deleuze and Guattari and Derrida, um, but to do so in a way that largely breaks from the sort of semiotic or linguistic or um, the emphasis of sign on signs that we see in post-structuralism. So rather than sort of a hermeneutic reading of Nietzsche, as we see in something like um, Nietzsche genealogy history by Foucault, where, where you see this sort of hermeneutic reading of Nietzsche as a, as a sort of genealogy or genealogical figure. Um, in Laruel, you get, you get an attempt at something that's a-signifying, an a-signifying motor that is what produces the science, but is not itself a system of science or a semiotic system. Oh, thank you for that, Jacob. In fact, one of the parts that stood out in the paper that you gave me, and of course I will link that in the show notes, is the whole section on the a-signifying rupture that is ahistorical that comes out of Nietzsche's work that validates what uh, some would call pejoratively the hermeneutics of innocence, right? How is it that we can justify, for example, Nietzsche, who clearly says some very reactionary things, but is motivating or instigating a kind of movement of thought, perhaps very intentionally too, with, with a, a kind of self-awareness and self-understanding that the kind of writing that he's engaging in is not representational. And given that that is the case, that validates us or author authorizes us in some way to think of Nietzsche in terms of a process rather than an individual to which, you know, any number of attributes, you know, we can reduce him to, oh, he said this, therefore he's reactionary. He said this, therefore he's a revolutionary thinker. And I think that's a really such an apt usage of this concept that comes out of Deleuze and Gattari, this idea that there is something to writing that is beyond representation. Um, and, and maybe we can dig into that when that becomes important throughout the discussion. Uh, with that said, I'll just turn to Jeremy quickly. It, are there any gaps that you wanted to fill in, or, or why do you think, for example, that Laruel brings something to Nietzsche scholarship that's unique or novel? Thanks for this, and thanks for this question, Craig. Um, so, I I don't want to like repeat what Jacob said, but I think what Jacob has kind of highlighted here is pretty much like where does Laruel place himself in this kind of large. Uh, range of scholarship, both narrow and broadly. But of course, um, to go back to like the original kind of questions that you've posed here regarding political materialism, and even, uh, I mean, he also provides another concept called machinic materialism. And both of these kind of are seen as not only, I, I hesitate to call them, quote, replacements of Marxist theory, because then it's like we're substituting one for the other, as if the same problematics are found specifically uh, to kind of like replace historical for political and dialectical for it, like, et cetera, uh, for the machinic. Now, my concern is that, like, I, I mean, I think if you were to ask me questions regarding Laruel here, 
we have to look at where this is situated in his work. This, we're not dealing with non-philosophy, you know, in this instance. So uh, we're not in the land of nowhere anymore, Toto. Like it's it's not what we're dealing with today. Um, instead, um, we're dealing with precisely this period uh, of philosophy one, where some of these problematics are very much indebted to, as Jacob already mentioned, um, kind of his relationship between uh, Deleuze and even Derrida. Um, so one of the major things, or actually two of the major things to go back to this question of materialism, is that he would argue that political materialism occupies and displaces the problematics of historical materialism in the Marxist tradition. Now, if we were to think about this um, very broadly, um, or even like, I guess, very vulgarly, um, we could try to reduce uh, like historical materialism to a maxim. Social being determines consciousness would be one way of kind of I, 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 um, articulating what historical materialism might be. Um, instead, it's there is a unity of libido and power. So unity that unity determines the relations of power, according to Laruel. And these relations of power could be seen not just as specifically superstructures or the superstructural in general, but also all the interpretations that come into play with that. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. So the political materialism is also something that's developed not just in this text alone, but it's also in the text that follows this book, um, Beyond the Power Principle, Au-delà du principe de pouvoir. Um, and it's developed further into that text dealing with hermeneutics and minor hermeneutics. Um, but to go into this a little bit more, uh, the machinic materialism, and this is meant to occupy and displace the positions of dialectical materialism. Now, what's dialectical materialism? Uh, how do I summarize this and piss off all the Marxists that are probably listening to this? Well, it's definitely not uh, everything's in motion or anything like that. Uh, it's rather, okay, so materialism, according to Lenin and even Althusser in that tradition, dialectical materialism is a reflection without a mirror. It reflects social being in a way that that tightly round uh, relationship is going to get to that adequate representation as much as possible. Um, so if social being determines consciousness, how do we get consciousness in a dialectical relationship with that social being would be a way to articulate that, quote, dialectical materialism. Now, machinic materialism is not a reciprocal, reversible relationship. It's actually kind of like it impacts it and it's part of that kind of relationship, but it continues to produce something productive and destructive. So the theory of its materialism could also lead to its downfall or decline or even twilight, depending on how you realize the word or translate the word decline, uh, downfall, twilight, decline. Um, it's meant to be able to, as Craig, you mentioned, like to reach this process, to also articulate, um, let's say, I'm trying to think of what the Nietzsche phrase is, to go to the end of what it can do, but also to uh, end up being that which it is, right? So like to, to be recognized uh, as individuated, really. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like, I struggle with this period, particularly because um, I'm more of a non-philosophy person and not like uh, dealing with political and machinic materialism, but I re re rework these kinds of concepts um, in my dissertation, but that's a whole aside. Um, it's something that interests me particularly because of how one could find something potentially uh, revitalizing in terms of Laruel as a thinker. Uh, to put into these perspectives what would be meaningful for that kind of dialogue, for future scholarship, for any sorts of even practical scholarship, practical practical use of non-philosophy. Um, so um, 
I don't know if there's any other gaps that I'm missing here, Jacob. Um, but I think I think I've kind of covered those kinds of bases. Do you guys mind quick if I, I just put something on the table? Uh, I just have, you know, certain listeners in mind who might not be familiar with this material or even Dulos and Gatari. And I'm just wondering, how does this chalk up? Um, how does the theory chalk up in, a, in order to explain, for example, the role of the family in social reproduction? Uh, I'm not sure if, you know, may, maybe I'm putting you guys on the spot here, but you know, given that this has been a theme, you know, not only in Marx and Engels, but also in Deleuze and Gattari, does Laruel have anything to say about that? Like when, when he talks about this concept of political materialism, which hopefully we'll unpack in a second, um, is there a way that we can sort of ascribe the, the theory of the libido as Laruel understands it in order to interpret the role of the family, you know, with respect to the development of capitalism throughout time? Or at least in terms of a paradigmatic case of where, for example, where the shift from uh, dialectical materialism and the, uh, particularly the Alphasarian rendition of base and superstructure Marxism, you've got the base, economic base, superstructure, ideologically subjective side, they both feed into each other. Insofar as, it, at least it seems to me, that the innovation of political materialism is or as and 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 or machine materialism as Narel depicts it, is by importing this indeed this physis from Nietzsche. This one of the things I think that is hard to actually get rid of from Nietzsche, even if you accept, which is I, I'm quite sympathetic to, his very reactionary um, origins in regards to the 1848 revolutions, the Paris Commune. But it's this one thing that lingers, which is the real being heart of the French Nietzschean tradition, which is the physics, the theory of forces, the dynamism which cancel after after the first critique which Schelling sought to develop which Hegel kind of bracketed out we didn't really get anything until Bergson but ultimately what is the paradigmatic shift from dialectical to machinic or political materialism because it seems like the paradigm shift in a way is is zooming in rather than thinking of these concrete units of base superstructure family mode of production these big capital letter beginning terms, it seems that what Laruel's doing here is he's zooming in and kind of what, what Schelling was doing of the atom, and just to explain for the listeners, Schelling's critique of mechanism, mechanics, was that the units, the billiard balls, one hits the other, cause effect, atoms bump into each other, simple as. His critique of that was the units of these basic physical um, scientific operations were themselves created by a conflux or a confusion, literally in the sense of being fused together of forces, attractive and repulsive. And we now know this in the sense that every atom has a strong and weak nuclear force. So if, if I'm right in saying that Zarowell is zooming in on the forces that make the, the chess pieces, that say, on the board of dialectical materialism, is he changing targets in the way that Craig's talking about the family, or is he simply revealing the conflux of forces that produce those units that come into political consideration as the family, as the proletariat, as the bourgeoisie, and so on and so forth? So I, I have a speculative thought that I, I, I might get to after Jeremy, um, but I would say the latter, that it, it's more interested, it's less interested in the particularity than it is in the political production uh, that gives birth to these mechanisms. So, so we would say like the, the family is, we might say it's a sign, right? The, the, it's, a, it's a particular sign or a structure that develops through a historical process. Um, so the, 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 I don't think Laruel gives an explanation of the particularities that give rise to the family. What he does is he is interested in developing an understanding of the process by which those particularities emerge historically. Um, so rather than focusing on, okay, so I'll get to my speculative thought right now. So, so if we look at, like, I'm not well versed on Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche, but um, Heidegger is interested in a genuinely historical 
philosophy in those in those lectures. Um, sort of his critique of Nietzsche is that Nietzsche is still doing metaphysics, and that um, in order to escape, sort of like the the eternal return and the will to power are like these last aspects of metaphysics that need to be overcome in order to think historically. Um, so my speculative thought here is that part of what we can maybe read a little bit of the critique of historical materialism towards political materialism, not only in response to Marx, but also in response to Heidegger. Um, that it's not about thinking historically, it's about thinking politically. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have to get to that <laughs> um, by unpacking political, uh, by unpacking political materialism. But that's, but that's sort of, I think, where we're getting. Um, just to add on to that, I, I would absolutely agree with Jacob um, that this is particularly more concerned less with, like, let's say, the process by which how these kinds of uh, specificities or structures come about, but it's like, what can we do with them? So one of the major things that comes up at the end of the book Nietzsche contra Heidegger is the use, the question of use, Brauch in uh, Heidegger, um, that there is many uses of Nietzsche, there's many uses of interpretations, but how do we get to, let's say, a use of all the materials of this continent of politics to invent the future or to bring about the downfall or decline of existing dominant modes of power and this also could be re read as like let's say destituency in a way um to relate it to some of the contemporary scholarship in that field with Agamben and many others uh the sense of destituent power but it's also something that is kind of like irreducible to um yes and use as well um but it's irreducible to kind of how we would envision let's say revolution in the the marxist tradition um it's it's probably where me and jacob would butt heads the most because it's like what is the positive project in terms of this kind of approach um because it leaves a lot of room to, to desire much like non-philosophy does there's there's the negative project, which is the critique of dominant modes of representing power, where power is only going to be seen as dominant power and not actually power in the sense of the will to power or the eternal return of the same and its unity with the libido. And that kind of sense of um, relationship with um, how we're to conceive of revolution is kind of left to be desired or even more so like what it, we we're left with this thought of what does it look like what are you giving us Laura well what is the positive project of that result so so yeah I, I think we would butt heads because I actually like the the positive project here a lot more than I do in non-philosophy um because what I see in, in this book in terms of a project, project is actually quite a Marxist project. Um, I think where we get with political materialism is permanent revolution. Um, so what we'll, we'll need to unpack is sort of the, the way that political materialism works through the, the use of Deleuze and Guattari in terms of the machinic, but also in terms of Derrida and the supplement. So these are these are like the two main things that we'll we'll get to in a moment. But I think what we get at the uh, uh, what the politics of this book ultimately leads to is that rebellion and revolution are persistently going against the politics of mastery so if, if we think about signification uh right in in, in something like anti-edifice they'll talk about like signification as being fascist or being edible um 
because it, it's a closure, right? Uh, uh, signification doesn't allow for for change. And so what we get, rather than what we get in, in Deleuze and Guattari, instead we get this supplement. Um, in, in Deleuze and Guattari, they want to talk about inclusive disjunction. They want to talk about complementarity, um, which are terms that absolutely need to be unpacked. Um, but what Lara Well wants to do is, is say, well, no, what we have is a, a supplementarity um, that is always going against signification, always undoing signification. But when it undoes signification, what it does is it produces a new signification. And that signification, once again, needs to be undone by this, by this rebel that's haunting, um, right, right, hauntology, the, the supplement that's haunting every instance of signification is always once again undone by this asignifying libidinal process. And so what we get in terms of a pro positive project, if you want to call that, is this persistent um, unfolding, this persistent permanent revolution that I think really works as a, as a, within certain forms of Marxism um, as permanent revolution. Can I ask a quick follow up on that? In terms of the 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 the, the idea that there's you know what one signifies, you know. The, the word cat signifies a, a fairy animal with four legs and likes pushing over glasses of water and the like, you know. Um, is, is the critique to some extent a, not to completely reduce it, but in the, the surplus of what is signified against what against signification, is there something of a critique in terms of the map versus the territory? In terms of going back to the problematic of territory to learn guitar pick up which is there are all these various forces that are you know, sprawling across the territory and eventually some become dominant become fixed become habitual and that's what ends up on the map in terms of the, the politics of what forces stick around which ones win out is this is this what lara wells talking about when it comes to what signification means in the sense of what meanings stick around when we say a word means this as opposed to when to take you know any use of word which you can change the meaning over time or have words used by sort of people with dumps of the power versus people who are subjects of that power who can change it is laravel sort of entering on the scene as a trying to give a physics of the, the territory underneath the map that politics is, is working with with regards to um the sort of tendency of all of these um, positions that Laura Wells kind of thinking of in this work. Um, it's probably best to think about what he calls the continent of politics and also kind of situate that in terms of relating it to uh, the continent of history in Marx and Althusser's reading, right? So <clears throat> in one of the theses, uh, I think thesis four or something like that, I'm making up the number probably um let me check the book i have the book folks so um yes thesis four the invention of the continent of politics he uh, larwell writes in thesis four marx discovers the continent of history but nietzsche invents the continent of politics or political continent however you want to translate it which is a break or cut distinct from the Marxist one because it is specifically political, both to its object and its conditions, and that it involves a new definition of politics. And I think what, what it comes down to is what we need to understand is in this new definition of politics. And one of these ideas is um, that politics, according to Marx or even the Marxist tradition, is that this is always going to be related to the economic base in, in so far as that goes and how politics is a superstructural relationship. Rather than basing it on that kind of dynamic, it changes the orientation. Um, it changes its orientation, particularly in terms of its real object, which is not uh, which is not the matter of social being. The matter here is obviously, or the real is obviously the libido and its unity with power. Um, and I think in this sense, it's more of a flow than it is a particulate matter. 
right? It's a flow that kind of is indeterminate and asignifying. Um, and also one could even say anti-political, but anti in the sense of like problematic anti. Um, and something that Jacob picks up in his own work, um, but also kind of like in insofar as the um the use of the question mark goes, um, question mark in Deleuze uh in in difference and repetition, this refers to non-being or the, the being of the problematic. And I think in this sense, the anti-political serves as that motor um, for rethinking these kinds of definitions of politics. The anti-political actually is the thing that determines the politics, or the anti-political is this force that I don't want to say precedes, because um, it's kind of imminent to the political and leads to its downfall. Um, in a way. So maybe Jacob could probably add on to this a little bit um, in relationship to De and Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. So, so you asked the question about like the sign and, and the map in relation to the, to the territory. Um, and it really comes down to what sort of, this question really comes down to what sort of semiotics we're talking about, right? If we're, if we're talking about like a Sasaurian uh linguistic form of semiotics um that sort of duality might work um but in terms of like the semiotics that Deleuze and Guattari are using in uh a thousand plateaus for sure probably anti-Oedipus as well is coming out of Gemslev and uh Peirce which is a much more materialistic sort of of semiotics that isn't so much interested in like the distinction between um the 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 map of the territory but the territory itself is is composed of signs uh right when 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 i walk across the field in a certain direction and you go in the same direction and then people repeatedly walk in that direction well there's a new sign that that develops in that pathway um that is a a material sign that develops um so to my mind when, when we're talking about the a signifying process that leads to the de development of that sign well what is what is sort of the the a signifying aspect that leads us all to desire to walk down that that particular pathway in the in the territory and actually produce the sign in the territory um right so politics is is then all about this sort of underlying like machinic libidinal process that leads to the development of that sign um right we can we can trace historical factors but we can also maybe trace um like this 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 something that haunts that leads to like this haunting the supplementary thing this libidinal supplement um that supplements sort of the historical material factors no i think this is fantastic i mean especially in terms of the the supplements being on the ends as, as jeremy was saying as well what determines politics because in terms of our own representational politics particularly in the west and of course the Canada, UK, US today, it is the precisely the anti-political, that which refuses representative democracy in the, the parliamentary sense that makes it quote unquote political. It is the refu it's the refusal of people in the streets today refusing the, for example, uh, the, 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 the complicity and the active support of the US, UK, Canada in the ongoing genocide in Palestine, which makes it a political action by refusing the politics and the, the very signifying structure of representation in our so-called democratic societies. But on that note, I'll pass it over to Craig, uh, I believe for something. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say very quickly that Laruel's framework really offers an apt uh, set of concepts to talk about the problems of class reductionism or any any kind of political reductionism. I, I would say specifically class reductionism because in, in opposing the, the figures of, of Nietzsche and Marx, uh, and particularly the the idea of this sort of molarized economic field, you know, this very discrete sort of concept of the economic that leads where, you know, 
effects within the social field, such as, you know, family issues or, you know, habitual drug use and, and, and things like that, all can be reduced down to some sort of economic problem at its base. And uh, I mean, I see this is clearly not doing that. In fact, one of the things, another thing that I really liked about Jacob's paper was, is that this connection between Deleuze's concept of the image of thought and the concept of mastery, where any particular thought, philosophy, or concept itself tends towards arrogating to itself all sorts of potentially theorizable content and bringing it you know, into the fray, or at least under the command of the language of that particular philosophy. And one of the things that Laruel seems interested in with respect to Nietzsche is this power to involute or destitute thought in such a way as to bring about new ways of thinking about resistance, thinking about rebellion and so forth. And that, in part, is part of the permanent revolution, being able to think that difference outside of a, a particular mode of thinking or a particular philosophy. And I, you know, this could also be, you know, this is one of the things that I find myself up against with Deleuze. You get to a certain point, you're like, okay, I kind of know my way around here. How can I overcome this? You know, where where are the limits? What are the problems here? And how, where is it, for example, that this concept can take me and where can't it take me? And this is the, the way that I see, for example, the idea of, of mastery being this impasse to thinking beyond a particular image of, of thought as being very important. So maybe I'll maybe I'll jump in and I'll say that, uh, Adam, your last comment bites completely against your critique of Nietzsche's criticism of the Paris Commune as reactionary. Like, like, like it just the communism is not just when you do the commune, first of all, but we'll have this debate some other time. It, like like yeah but sterner would not was not a proponent of of the bourgeois moralism that underpinned the 1848 commune like they tried to abolish bourgeois social relations by making juridical uh bourgeois morality it's that, like that was like, that's the that's the most sternarian the least sternarian thing you could do um so the the question that i have is this attempt to retain sort of as much of of Nietzsche as possible, but primarily through his complexity, right? So Laurel does this really, like, does this really interesting sort of analysis of the state of Nietzschean philosophy, right? And this kind of really hasn't been done. Like, we get a lot of people who want to, like, everyone from, like, uh, it, it's kind of similar to the whole like Heidegger thing where you got like Wolin who wants to say like, this is what certain Heideggerians do and this is what other Heideggerians do and, or like Donatello di Cesare. But you don't actually get like a good articulation. You have, oh, there are the French Heideggerians. There are the German Heideggerians. You get that with Nietzsche too, where there are the French Nietzscheans. But Laruel recognizes, perhaps because he is in that milieu at the time, that like actually French Nietzscheanism is a unified thing doesn't fucking exist. Like, um, like it's a lie. It's not real. Like Deleuze's Nietzsche, Klosowski's Nietzsche, and Foucault's Nietzsche are all radically, radically, radically different, and they all radically disagree with one another. Um, but like the one that the one thing that stood out to me, and I'm gonna have to keyword search Deleuze, which is not good scholarship, um, is uh, when he says that on the plane of political materialism, the whole work remains to be done even if it is very broadly begun. For example, by Foucault on partial theoretical bases and by Deleuze. So what he sort of is, tr like what I'm trying to understand with this exploration of, of Nietzsche's um, sort of new form of materialism that's going to sort of supplant or allow us to, to explore avenues of political relations that say a more um, French Marxism won't allow us to. He sees this already kind of in its incipience in Deleuze and Foucault in very different ways, um, right? Where for, for Deleuze, Nietzsche is a political thinker precisely because of his account of forces. Whereas for Foucault, Nietzsche is a political 
uh, political um, thinker, precise, or uh, Nietzsche's a political thinker, but needs to go through that thing that Heidegger points out, right? Where like if Foucault wants to just set aside and bracket like the eternal return and the will to power. Like Foucault makes it very clear that his account of power is not that sort of um, vitalistic uh, uh, assurance or interplay of forces. Um, so like what is the fundamental challenge for La Ruelle in trying to bridge this gap? Because it seems like so much of Nietzsche's scholarship is this attempt to sort of Except that Nietzsche is an aphoristic thinker, which means he's going to contradict himself and then say, oh, there's this image of Nietzsche I like, I'm going to take it. And that's what Foucault does, right? Like I have Nietzschean theses, which are non-Nietzschean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Deleuze is like, no, 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 no. Like, I just want this Nietzsche that like beats the shit out of Kant. And I'm not really interested in this historical Nietzsche because like I'm a metaphysician. Oopsies. Like, so like what? La Ruel wants to retain both of these very different Nietzsche's. And I think that's the thing that makes La Ruel sort of different from Foucault and Deleuze, in that he really actually wants to take Nietzsche seriously in that way that Deleuze and Foucault won't. So um, sort of what are the maneuvers that allow us to do that? Because like my brain just can't. So, like I, I have the same position where like, ah, I just don't like that aphorism. I don't like what he says in Echo Homo about like, I don't know. Uh, you know, the the masculine or whatever. I just want to put it away. I, I like the genealogy. Um, so yeah. What's what's the maneuver that that La Ruel takes there? Yeah, I, I think that's that's sort of almost like the central question when when coming into this text. Um and I, I would say that what La Ruel is trying to do fundamentally is say in in its own sort of bracketing, let's bracket Nietzsche as the historical figure don't care right there's like if you read through nietzsche contra heidegger there's like no citations he doesn't he doesn't cite. i mean that's general laura Wells scholarship there's no citations of anything um which is incredibly frustrating but especially with nietzsche like he doesn't he doesn't cite nietzsche at all um and he he barely like talks about nietzsche as like a, a like nietzsche's actual work it just doesn't interest him at all so what he's not interested in is in Nietzsche as a historical figure. So he could care less, right? Which Nietzsche says, yeah, it, it is it is super Nietzschean. Um he but what he what he's interested in um is both how Nietzsche as a as the as like a libidinal process is able to both create all these different aphorisms, but also as a process able to create all these different readings of Nietzsche, like able to create the Foucault Nietzsche, able to create the, the Deleuze Nietzsche, the Klesowski Nietzsche, the Heidegger Nietzsche, the, right? He's interested in what is the process by which these various instantiations come about. And um, I, I, Anthony Paul Smith has this really interesting quote uh, about non-philosophy uh where he he talks about it as um like uh uh like the the machine that like crushes the atoms together um in physics i can't remember what it's called like uh, uh, one of these machines that that just like swings and yeah a particle accelerator like laruel is doing this with philosophy um and you can you can almost see it here too less, less uh, with different instantiations of nietzsche it's just like well um what it, what is what is just like going on if we just like fling these things together and see what's happening um i've almost thought about it as like doing um a, a functionalist or behaviorist approach to nietzsche if we if we use terms from the philosophy of mind um if it, it, it like in in cybernetics they talk about uh behaviorism um this is sort of an approach that was in, uh put forward by uh wiener and some other scholars um in sort of their foundational approach to cybernetics which is we don't really care about um what's underlying um the sort of uh processes that we're exploring we're just going to treat them as individual processes um and just study them 
as they're actually operating. So it, it, behaviorism doesn't really care about motivation or intention. It just cares about the process itself because like intention can lie. Um, so if we, te- if, we, if, if we study the various Nietzsche processes and just like see what's going on, what are the sort of ramifications that we can pull out? Um, and I think what Lara well sort of does is go, well, we have this this sort of thing that keeps happening is we we get different people putting forward uh, a sign of Nietzsche, a mastery, right? They want to close off what Nietzsche is. So the Nazis do this, Deleuze does this, Klazowski does this, Foucault does this. Each of them is is putting forward a sign of what constitutes Nietzsche and allowing that sign to determine who Nietzsche is. But each time this sign is undone, right? Somebody undoes it somehow, right? Some, somebody comes about and, and ruptures or cuts or breaks. Um, we don't really need to get into the technical reasons why we would use any of these words, but somebody ruptures this form of mastery that is Nietzsche. How is this happening? And he puts, so what he does is he puts forward this chiasm. And this is really the, the one of the more important parts of, of the work is this chiasm. We have these four points. We have, we have mastery, we have fascism, we have rebellion, and we have revolution. These are the, and these are aligned with two poles. So we have the master and fascist pole on the one end, there's mastery, which wants to put forward a particular image of thought or a particular sign. And then we have uh, fascism, which tries to keep that sign in place without allowing any other figure to develop. But along this other pole, we have the rebel and the revolutionary. And the rebel is, for Laura Well, this figure of difference with an A in the Derridian sense um, that is nevertheless a libidinal process in the Delizian sense, which uses this alternate pole of revolution to unilaterally disrupt the form of mastery each time. So every time there's a new signification of mastery, it is undone by this libidinal but differential with an A process that ruptures the form of mastery, allowing a new signification to emerge. But this new signification each time becomes then the new form of mastery. So when Deleuze undoes Heidegger or when uh, Foucault undoes Klazowski or whatever, um, each time they become the new figure of mastery that will then subsequently be undone by a new interpretation of Nietzsche. But I think what Laurel is trying to do is by saying that Nietzsche is not actually a sign or a signification, but this a-signifying process itself, he's trying to sort of set up his own form as something that cannot be then reinscribed as a new form of mastery. I mean, whether he is successful in this is maybe debatable, but that's sort of what he's trying to do by mapping out the process rather than a particular uh, form of mastery. He's trying to simply show how each Nietzsche is undone by subsequent interpretations. And that to me seems the the ultimate challenge that Laro is up against, and he does present some tools with which to think that through. Um, In your paper, Jacob, you have a sentence that I thought was pretty important. He talks about the libido, the libidinal operation, which is, you know, the concept to which everything in political materialism is reducible to. He says that difference is a libidinal operation. It is sovereign, but it is not primary. And the, the, the question that I always try to think through especially when it comes to destituent politics, for example. How is it that we can head off the infiltration of political essences, abstract political essences, back into thinking 
what we believe the libido to be, a set of social relations that flows within the social field. Um, I mean, there's other concepts that we could go to, for example, the, the concept of the unconscious as the social body and the way that Deleuze and Gattari and Laruelle steal that from Freud. And what, what, what I really like about Laruelle is he involutes this figure of the master as Freud as a way and that sort of retroactively authorizes Deleuze and Gattari's concept of uh, the, the social unconscious is that which is appropriated from this interiority and then expanded and unfolded upon uh, what we ordinarily call the social body. But maybe you could go through that argument just a little bit. Um, how does he defend this notion of sovereignty such that for example, the, the idea of difference or the idea of the libido doesn't elevate itself to the level of a political abstraction. I think the question of sovereignty um, is a really complicated one, and I'm not sure that I totally get at it in my thesis, um, but I think it, it's an important one. Um, I think Lara Well wants to distinguish sovereignty from mastery, and he does so by way of, of Derrida. Um, so I think if uh, the issue for Lara Well with Deleuze and Guattari um, is that they're basically trying to say, okay, so there's been these this figures of stability these sort of state thinkers uh, who prioritize being over becoming, we're going to prioritize becoming over being, right? This is sort of Deleuze's Bergsonianism. It's really sort of an inversion where we affirm difference and becoming, and we sort of push back against stability and, and form. Uh, this really comes out in uh, Lara Wells' uh, second period in The Philosophies of Difference. Um, I think he has a better critique of, of Deleuze there. That's, but that's sort of the critique, is that um, Deleuze turned... He, he has a statement that is like, oh, the pre he, he compares the list to the pre-Socratics saying the pre-Socratics said everything was fire, everything was water, everything was earth, etc. Deleuze, Derrida, they say everything is difference. Um, that's largely his critique of their thinking. And so um, if you were merely to pursue sovereignty as difference in the Deleuzean sense, uh, as difference in itself, um, which is how Deleuze closes difference and repetition. Um, and at the end of difference and repetition, Deleuze outlines um, these three different ways of thinking about the eternal return. Um, and so there's the eternal return of the same, where everything returns. There's the eternal return with a difference, where we have some things returning, but not everything. Um, and then we have this third form of the eternal return, which Deleuze claims Nietzsche did not theorize, but is sort of implicit in Nietzsche's work, which is the eternal return of difference in itself, where nothing returns, but we just have this difference is what returns. Um, but for Lara, well, if we do that, we're basically just turning difference into a new form of mastery, into a new form of... So and so difference cannot be the sort of sovereignty that Lara well wants. Um, because it just becomes a new mastery. And if it just becomes a new mastery, then it's going to be subordinated again, once again, by the process of Nietzsche thought as this a signifying cut or rupture. And so this is where uh, Lara Weld turns to Derrida and the use of the supplement or the use of difference with an A um, to suggest that this different, this libidinal differential with an A surplus is um, supplementary. It's not, it's not a primordial ontological thing. It's, it's more ontological, it's more haunting mastery than it is um, this, this pure transcendental generation. It has to be something almost non-transcendental. Um, and so he wants sovereignty to adopt 
more of this place where it never comes fully into presence in, in like a Derridian sense, that it's always this sort of thing that's not quite absent or not quite present. And it, do we need to, would it be helpful to define difference with an A a little bit? Oh, um, please do. Yes. Okay. Difference <laughs> so, as we often see it. Yeah. Out. So, so difference with an A comes out of this speech that Derrida gave in uh, like 1968, I believe. Um, and it was, uh, it's fun to, to note that it was a speech and not uh, a paper because Derrida was literally standing up there going difference is like difference with an A is, is different than difference because uh, it's, it's seen and not heard. So, so the idea of difference with an A and the reason I say difference with an A and not difference is because difference with an A is only different from difference with an E when you see it on the page. They're supposed to be linguistically said the same because the, the, the difference between difference with an A and difference with an E is trying to point out that break between the spoken word and the written word. So when you, when you read it, it versus when you see it, Linguistically, it, 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 there's no difference between difference with an A and difference with an E. They're said the same, but they're spelled differently. And so Derrida is trying to pull out this sort of gap that exists between the spoken and written word that is never quite put forward. He's, he's trying to, to outline this gap. And so to, to bring difference with an A into presence when we're talking, we have to say difference with an A. There's always this gap between the actual word and the presentation of that word as difference than difference with an E. And so Derrida is trying to show that the spoken word has this sort of absence that needs to, that is never fully brought into presence when we say it. It, it, there's always this this absence that's never quite there and it's never quite fully absent it's never quite fully present it's it's this this weird thing that we can't really explain and we can't really define but it's central to what we're doing um i kind of like thinking about uh the swamp thing um the swamp thing as a figure of difference with an a um because the swamp thing is both this person who dies and not that person who dies right he, he's this guy who 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 dies but all of his memories and all of his form are remembered in the swamp thing um so the swamp thing it alex insists upon the swamp thing right alex both is the swamp thing and is not the swamp thing it's like impossible to to separate this human person from the swamp thing um, because this human is always insisting upon the swamp thing, but never quite there. And so there's this, this kind of gap that's always trying to be brought into presence. Um, Alan Moore. Well, actually, actually, I think both, because, because uh, you need both. <laughs> Donald Davidson haunts Alan Moore, you know? Um, anyway. <laughs> um, so, so... What Laurel is trying to do then is rather than make difference into a transcendental force as it is in difference and repetition, make it into this like haunting, haunting, ontological difference with an A sort of force. And that's what sovereignty is. So so rather than being mastery, it's it's sovereignty. I also want to add that there are a bunch of neologisms, not just like difference, a difference with an A, but there's also like use of some neologisms in Nietzsche contra Heidegger, uh, such as like Deleuze and Guattari's uh, notion of the core, uh, plane core or the core plane, uh, which has been translated as the full body. Um, in in uh, in Nietzsche contra Heidegger and some of the other works that are affiliated with this period, there's core plane, but the 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 plane sound is actually with an A as opposed to an E. So sometimes 
we might have to play with that language a little bit to uh, indicate whether or not it's a full body or a full body, uh, F-O-L-L -L body in a way. Uh, or there's essence and essence with an A, essence with an A, um, appearance, uh, appearance and appearance with an A. Uh, there's a lot of these kinds of supplementary inversions that go into play in this work as well as others. Um, even going so far as to call a, a reference with an A uh, in uh, textual machines. So there's all these, uh, and I mean, like, it might just seem as like playful, uh, you know, um, interjections or playful uses of the language. It hi uh, highlights this kind of uh, tension that Jacob is highlighting here um, with regards to its supplementarity, its haunting a uh, spectral kind of nature that hides in the background uh, informing this kind of perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and oh, go ahead. So in, in this sense, um, there's sort of this um, element of, of Nietzsche that through this political materialism makes pot like it almost seems as though political materialism is something that Laruel needs to articulate but clearly thinks is something that informs everyone from Althusser to Foucault in different ways right even though they're radically different thinkers both of them need this element um so I'm wondering then is sort of if 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 Nietzsche if Nietzsche discovers sort of the the interpenetrability or the inseparability of psychology, sociology, et cetera, et cetera, from history, right? And each of these thinkers is trying to um, sort of siphon off either Nietzsche as sociologist, say like Kaufman, Nietzsche as psychologist, say in very different ways, Carl Jung or Gilles Deleuze. And then Nietzsche as historical genealogist like um, Deleuze and, and like Agamben. Um, and Agamben is probably the most critical of Nietzsche, of the Nietzscheans. Um, it, in a certain sense, uh, or like again with, with Althusser, but in a certain sense, though, though all of these thinkers for Laurel make the mistake of, of sort of siphoning off. Um, uh Nietzsche they each retain an element of of political materialism no does someone feel like they can take that question <laughs> or at least the possibility of a political materialism um or does it need to or does it need to contain all of this in order for it to to really be able to sort of take over the the sort of internal critique of Marxist historical materialism. Because I know Laruel thinks that like example for Foucault, like Foucault is much closer to a Marxist historical materialism than say he would be to a political materialism. Right? What would Foucault need, for example, in order to become a political materialist? Like let's 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 take Foucault as an example. What does Foucault need? What does he lack that that st still puts him back into the classical tradition of historical materialism? So so my answer would be, and and this is coming directly from uh, Mindy Biswas Malenfi's work, is that the issue with Foucault's Nietzsche is that Foucault is still working with a hermeneutic um that that foucault is interested in an in a hermeneutic nietzsche so so foucault's genealogical method um is selective for sure it's uh right it's using principles of selection in order to produce a genealogy rather than a history um but it's still working on the realm of hermeneutics and so to become a political materialist would be to withdraw from 
the realm of hermeneutics to instill instead consider the production of hermeneutics. And so if there's an element of political materialism in Foucault, it's that Foucault gets closer to thinking through this production through the use of genealogy, right? Genealogy rather than thinking about Nietzsche as a particularity, right? Genealogy is much more creative than like a historical account of Nietzsche as we get in something like Lacerdo, which is just like, no, we need this very historical Nietzsche that we can like pinpoint exactly what Nietzsche thought. Like Foucault doesn't really care what Nietzsche thought. Um, Lara Wells saying, yeah, Foucault, you're doing a, a great job and you get partially there, but you're still working in, in the realm of hermeneutics and the realm of signification. And we want in political materialism to think, well, what is the process? What are the conditions that allow for hermeneutics in the Foucaultian sense to emerge? Here's a little riff that I would like to try, and um, maybe we can think through this together. Thinking the inversion of political materialism, or at least perhaps the concerns that come from left Nietzscheanisms and right Nietzscheanisms. What the right Nietzschean is fundamentally, no, let's start with left Nietzscheanism. What the left Nietzschean, or what, what people on the left would be concerned about with left Nietzscheanism, perhaps broadly construed, is the possibility of something that we call critique would lose its criticality because it abandons hermeneutics and embraces a kind of libidinal immediacy that's often associated with fascism. On the right, the one thing that some folks on the right might criticize a right Nietzschean for is the idea that if you go full Nietzschean, that in some sense either obligates you to or entails in some way a loss of a, a state or stasis. Um, uh, basically, you lose essences in the sense that then opens you to the possibility, I mean, just think about gender and, and, and everything besides. Is that an apt way to sort of frame perhaps the difference or, or, or the fear that would be encountered by, you know, either side of what we understand as the political divide with respect to Nietzsche? Maybe, maybe somebody has a better way of thinking about that. Jeremy, do you want to handle this first? Because I have, I have an answer as it relates to my current scholarship, but Jeremy might be able to situate it better in Laura Well. Sure. Um, so I could situate it in terms of Laura Well's work. I mean, as we, as I mentioned, like during the first podcast that I was on, you know, there is a break that uh, Laura Well makes between uh, Nietzsche to core and, and non-philosophy. So I think that uh, when it comes to this kind of divide, um, I don't think that Laura Wells kind of interested in this work in particular with like a leftist or rightist deviation. I think in, in particular, he's mostly interested in like, what does it mean to be an Achean? And what are those syntactic laws that determine what that might look like? Um, and I think when it comes to left and right kind of dichotomies with Nietzsche, it kind of misses the forest for the trees. Yeah, so I, I think both sides are right to be terrified of Nietzsche. That's, that's sort of my position. Um, so it, I, I'm, in my current work, I'm really interested in Denise Feria da Silva. Um, this is her book, uh, Towards a Global Idea of Race. Um, but in this book, uh, near the end of it, she talks about, um, she, I, throughout the book, she's really interested in the idea of transparency, um, in Kant and Hegel. Uh, her basic thesis is that Kant puts forward like the transparent eye, right through the transcendental aesthetic, and then Hegel transforms this transparent eye into a transcendental poiesis by immanentizing Kant's rational figure into the process of history. Um, and 
the Silva's like the affront to Kant and Hegel that we get through Nietzsche is the madman, right? Um, the affront to this rational project is madness, right? Madness is terrifying. Um, and nobody is willing to do it, right? Nobody is truly willing to combat this transparency and this rationalism because to actually combat transparency and rationalism is to like invoke this void. It's it's to just like to not be able to say anything. And so the difficulty that we get to at that point is either to invoke this madman or to try to find a way forward without invoking the madman. And like, I think a lot of my scholarship, including the master's thesis is trying to, to deal with this problem is how can, can thought get outside this tendency to mastery? And I think Laruel is trying to do that with Nietzsche here. He's trying to, to get outside this, this form of mastery by going, okay, like there's this persistent process that tries to undo it each time. And I think from both a right wing and a left wing perspective, and I think both right wing and left wing Nietzscheanisms fall into this trap to some degree if we're, if we're going from a Laruelian perspective, both want to turn Nietzsche into a figure of mastery. Right. If, if we get a, a like if we get the most uh, vulgar right wing reading of Nietzsche, that's like Jor if we take Jordan Peterson's reading of Nietzsche or something like absolutely abhorrent. Right. He wants to turn Nietzsche into a figure of mastery um, because you need to have that figure of mastery in order to have a right wing vision. But people on the left do the same thing. They want to say, well, Nietzsche is saying these things, because in order to have sort of a political project, <laughs> at least you have to have a, 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 at least a political project with a goal of whether that be communism or whatever, you have to, to have certain truth claims. And that's inherently against this sort of, but truth claims are claims to mastery. Um, so yeah, or, or normative claims do the same thing, right? Any normative claim is going to, so, so in order to actually accept what Lara Wall is saying about Nietzsche, it, it takes like, you have to be mad almost. You have, it, you have to take up this like really difficult thing to take up that I, I don't think is really possible to take up, but, um, perhaps there is something in trying to get there. And, and perhaps there is something about when we do reach an impasse, perhaps we need a little madness, perhaps we need a little stupidity or something in order to try to overcome that, that impasse. So I don't, I don't know if you could build a political project on political materialism. Um, I, I don't know what that would look like. Um, I have perhaps some speculations about ways that you could go about it um but never want uh you could never build a project that is fully fully formed or even desirable on on this sort of uh of theory of of politics jacob and jeremy i just want to thank you for coming on the show today in fact i think uh selecting this portion of the text is very apt and also very helpful for the journey that we've been on with those who are in our Patreon reading group, reading most recently Deleuze's Nietzschean philosophy, and also interacting with folks who identify as left Nietzscheans and evoking that conversation, which has been very productive in many ways. And I think this is a great way to sort of create a milestone, perhaps not cap it off because we're going to be reading Klosowski uh, and doing more with Nietzsche this year on Acid Horizon. So I just want to thank you again for coming on the show and and uh, we would love to have you back in the future to talk a little bit more about Francois Laruel. Anything to plug before you go? That's what I should ask. 
Well, there's an upcoming event at the University of Tulsa at the end of February uh, that Jacob will definitely be there. I'm still working on my circumstances uh, to attend this conference. Uh, it's called uh, Acts of Reading, uh, Humanities and Non-Philosophy. And Jacob is giving a talk on some of the things that we've touched on here and providing some criticisms of existing scholarship and non-philosophy. I'll be giving a keynote on um, one of Larwell's books on ethics, uh, which have has been of my interest lately. Um, but otherwise, uh, pr please purchase a copy of Phenomenon of Difference. Uh, this is this is definitely going to be very helpful for understanding some of the uh, lineage of Nietzschean philosophers that uh, Larwell is interested in, but also kind of. Uh, on Ravi Son, who he argues is the most Nietzschean of the pre bergsonian philosophers. So that's all I would have to plug here. Uh, so yeah, just thank you for having us today. Um, I don't have anything super recent to plug, um, but if you're interested in what we were talking about today, my master's thesis is on Lara Wells, Nietzsche, Contra Heidegger, largely attempting to bring Nietzsche, Contra Heidegger, into discussion with Deleuze and Derrida. Um, and that's available uh, through uh, Western University's library system. Um, and it should be free for anyone online. So if you're interested, check that out. Um, and I'll hopefully have some more things in the pipeline soon. But thank you all for having us today. Excellent. Maybe one last thing that I'll add is I can't wait to have the full text of Nietzsche Contra Heidegger translated into English. So anyway, that's a conversation for another time and we'll see you next time.